Hello everyone, good morning. Um, this is our second talk for the webinar for um, in terms of production engineering or even process engineering for petroleum engineering students uh, or even everybody uh, as for general. Okay, so today we have a, a really, really good speaker, uh, Mr. Danaraj uh, Turunavarasu. He is actually going to speak about oil and gas uh, process engineering. Okay, so just a little bit of background about uh, Mr. Danaraj. Okay, he is a certified uh, chartered engineer by iChemi and a certified professional technologist. He is currently attached to Intexi as an advisor as a flow, senior flow assurance consultant. He specializes in dynamic simulations and also wax management studies. He has shown passion in R&D and managed to be one of the investors, inventors for, the, for a process technology that recovers condensate from flare to reduce CO2 emission and enhance offshore oil production during his career in NGL Tech as a senior R&D or process engineer. He has developed a new process scheme or patent with MEG uh, it's an antifreeze or an, a hydrate in, uh, inhibition agent. The technology received new new uh, technology award at the OTC Asia Conference and a highly commended for the oil and gas award at the iChemi Global Awards in London. While he was attached to Petronas, his notable contributions were delivered in the face of various challenges from working in foreign countries Sudan facilities modification, for example, and contributed in the success of flow assurance studies in Mauritania, contributing to 1 million ringgit per day savings, which uh, was done with the hydrate blockage issue and in Turkmenistan, uh, asphaltine issues. He has been an active contributor in conferences, forums, and trainings for Petronas. He has, uh, he has established and published a paper on a study of phase behavior and its application to cryogenic technologies for treatment of high CO2 gas fields. This was accepted in the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE1 Petro, and he presented this in the Offshore Technology Conference, OTC, in Rio de Janeiro. He became a co-trainer for PVT and Equations of State Training, for process engineers patronas, and universities, for example, currently in APU as an adjunct lecturer for flow assurance while he is he was in Wood Group as well. This has led to his re, uh, recent certification as oil and gas uh, trainer for process engineering and flow assurance by HRDF under the Ministry of Human Resources. He has published four international papers and one patent in the field of phase behavior, carbon capture, flow assurance, waste management, and environment. In 2016 and 2018, he has been nominated and recognized by iChemi as one of the top four finalists in the Young Chemical Engineer in Industry Award category in Malaysia. He has continuously shown that with good attitude and the right nurturing, chemical engineers have limitless potential. Without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Danaraj. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Arvin, for the introduction. Um, perhaps let me share my screen now. All right. Uh, Harwin, I just would like to confirm whether you can you see my screen now? Harwin? Harwin? Yes, it can be seen, Mr. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you see my screen? Can. Yeah, all right. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you, Harwin, for the kind introduction. Um, Without further ado, let me, uh, uh, I'm Dan Raj, and currently I'm attached to Intexi at Vision. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the senior flow insurance engineer currently, uh, and I'm supporting a lot of projects uh, back in uh, Malaysia and also internationally. 
Um, today, I will be actually presenting on uh, an introduction to surface process facilities to, to most of the uh, uh, petroleum engineers in uh, APU. And uh, with, uh, before proceeding to the uh, presentation, I would like to actually present a safety moment uh, on uh, underrated flow lines, whereby uh, I think uh, most of the pet petroleum engineers here can uh, actually relate to. So this particular project is actually, uh, I, I have been attached to pro this project back in uh, Petronas, and I, this particular field is in, uh, in one of the uh, countries in Africa. So it's an it's a oil producing field. And, um, and they, are, they, have a, they, are, they have about 170 wells in this particular field. And most of, and they, and for, this, for this field, they were planning to produce four high GR wells in order to sustain the production. But uh, the the problem was actually there's a deep there's a bottleneck on the on the gas handling uh, on the processing facility. So they at one point of time when they were producing the high GR wells, they were they were flaring at a very very high rate uh, beyond the uh, design capacity of the flare stack. As you can see from this picture, the flare length is longer than compared to the uh, the flare stack. And operators actually observe a flat tip at the flat tip at the flat stack to, to be to be red colored, bigger flame size and increase uh, heat radiation. So due to this uh, due to this uh, issue and uh, due to this environment concern as well, uh, operation has actually kept the flaring capacity from seven, from seventy million scarf to thirty two million scarf. So they kept it uh, below just below uh, the design capacity of the flat stack, which is thirty six million scarf, by uh, renting a few uh, separators, well site separators. So basically, for the high GR well, what they would do, they did was they they channel the production into a separator, well test separator, which is just close by to the well, and they have. They, they separate the gas and oil and the oil it goes to the uh, the oil will be will be transferred uh, to the to the field uh, processing facility whereas the gas is being flat at the well site in a dump pit so this has actually uh, posed uh, an, uh, an environment uh, concern and also a safety issue and at the same time the shutdown system from the field processing facility from the processing facility is not fully integrated to the well, well site. And one of the most uh, uh, severe uh, safety issue here is actually uh, most all the wells are observed without any protection barrier, which is your surface control, subsurface safety valve, and also your uh, surface safety valve. So they, they were not uh, installed for all the wells. So basically, if that, let's say there's a shutdown on your field processing facility, this particular line from the, the, the transmission line or the pipeline from, um, from the well site to the processing facility will be, will be subjected to high pressure and, and over pressure. And the flow lines are also not fully rated to, to its uh, closing tubing at pressure. And there is no PSV observed from the well site to the processing facility. So as a process engineer myself, so we have uh, actually looked into it uh, thoroughly and we have proposed uh, some recommendation in order to include uh, a certain safety barrier and also shutdown system to to safeguard the the flow line, the four kilometer flow line uh, from uh, over pressure. So as I mentioned earlier, all the wells are without the SC SSV and also without the SSV. And your the rate the rating of um, all the flow line rating is about it's a uh, it's below the uh, below the CITHP, where the CITHP is about 1,400 to 2,500. So when the processing facility uh, has an emerging shutdown, the flow lines from the from the well to the processing facility, which is at about eight four kilometers, are subjected to high pressure. Therefore, uh, the 300 uh, pound of piping rating is not sufficient and pose a uh, HSC HSC concern. So all the associated valves, the check valves are also uh, not fully rated to its uh, uh, not fully rated, and uh, they are also rated to 300, 300 uh, pound. And there's there's no uh, SDV at the uh, at each of the flow lines. All right. 
so moving on so what we have proposed is uh, we have proposed to install two redundant uh, sdvs upstream of the ch uh, check valve this particular check valve and this particular flow line uh, we are to is to replace to 900 pound from 300 pound to 900 pound and with with its associated uh, check valve with, to be replaced to 900 pound as well and to install a riser valve or sdv at the departing line in order to safeguard your four kilometer flow line since it is uh, underrated as well right so there are two safety concerns here one is no immediate uh, safeguard which is your relief uh, valves and also your sc ssv and ssv and there's no fire and uh, gas detection so the, the recommendation would be to install two unit uh, electrical actuated shutdown valve, which is your actually your hip system, uh, high pressure protection uh, system in series upstream of the check valve, uh, six inch, uh, 900 pound, locally controlled with a redundant uh, pressure transmitters. And to in install a electrically actuated shutdown valve at the departing line for the high jaw valves, right? So alternatively, what we can do besides uh, installing the two hips valve, we can uh, the hips valve, we can actually install a relief valve. But however, relief valve require uh, additional facility, facility like such as the flare knockout drum, the associated piping to it, and the flare stack. So this will uh, this will uh, pose a higher higher cost to the project, right? And uh, at the same time, all the underrated uh, pipeline rating. This is another concern uh, subjected to high uh, CITHP, which is uh, uh, the close in tubing head pressure for approximately four kilometer during emergency shutdown. So we we are uh, we re we recommend to replace the flow line upstream of the check valve to 900 pound. So the length is about 10 meters times it by seven. So it's about for for all the five existing wells and also for all the future wells and to replace six inch check valve to 900 pound for all the 17 wells. All right. So this is our, this is our recommendation, recommendation for this uh, safety concern and also this uh, uh, environment concern. All right. But however, they, we have also recommended uh, to conduct uh, some safety studies such, such as uh, hazard hazard in order to implement uh, this uh, proposed recommendation. All right. Moving on. So the objective of this, uh, we are now we are back to the real presentation. So the objective of this uh, presentation is to provide an overview on uh, surface pro processing facility to petroleum engineers in order for them, this would uh, actually assist them for their field development uh, project in, in their final year. So in, it is in that intended that audience will reach at least uh, awareness level in uh, surface processing facilities. So this is the outline of the presentation today. So I have uh, I will be presenting on, on the main equipments uh, at, at the top side that you usually observe. So the first, uh, first module would be the crude oil processing and gas conditioning. Second module will be gas treatment for CO2 and H2S removal. Third module will be mercury removal. Uh, fourth would be pumping compression and heat transfer and water treatment as well. So there are even other topics such as a utility system, uh, utility system, flow oceans, uh, which will not be covered uh, in this particular uh, session. Um, and also process control and safeguarding. So there are many, many more things to process engineering. But today we will be just focusing on the main equipment uh, at top side on the surface facility. So module one, crude oil processing and gas conditioning. So um, at the end of the day, uh, audience should uh, should understand the purpose of the separating oil, gas, and water from well stream and the typical faci facilities involved. The principle of phase uh, separation and different types of uh, type of separators and its applications, and the purpose of uh, crude oil uh, processing, such as uh, dewatering and also stabilization, the formation of hydrates and their impact on facilities. And the purpose of methods for gas condi conditioning, which is your hydrocarbon depointing and also your water depointing. Uh, the understanding of commonly used uh, process for condensate stabilization. So let's look at uh, a typical process 
from your well to your sales gas or sales gas and oil specs. So in your well, your well comprises of uh, all these four components. So they we have uh, from your from, from from your well you have com components such as which is your production which which is your gas oil and water and each of these phases has its associated impurities so what at top side what it does is actually it will process the oil gas and water in order to meet the required specification uh, whether it is a sales gas specification sales oil specification and also to meet the environment uh, specifications so the exa an example of contaminants and impurities are CO2, H2S, sand, nitrogen, and uh, mercury. So for crude oil, we need to meet this spec, which is your read vapor, vapor pressure of uh, 10 to 12 PSI. This is uh, to avoid any safety issue, when uh, to avoid any vapor cloud formation uh, on your in your storage tank. Uh, this is this might might cause uh, ignition when there's an uh, ignition uh, ignition source uh, uh, in uh, in contact. So the next would be uh, BSNW, which is your basic sediment water, and we need to man maintain it below zero point five uh, vol vol volume percent. All right, salt of uh, ten to twelve pounds per thousand barrels oil, and API is depends on the is determined uh, from the price. So basically, a higher API gravity, the price would be uh, lower. So, sorry, the higher API gravity, the price will be higher. All right. So it, it, depending on the price, the price of your crude, such as Tapis. Tapis is one of the sweetest crude uh, and the most expensive crude uh, in the world. So that one has a very high API. All right. And uh, we need for the gas for the gas pack we need to meet the gross, gross heating value of your fuel gas, which is from 950, 950 to 1050 BTU per scuff. This is for for the full. This is the fuel gas pack specification. Water content two to seven pounds per million scuff. All right, in order to avoid any corrosion issue and also uh, hydrate formation. Hydrocarbon dew point temperature, which is a uh, mine uh, bill which is minus, minus 10 degrees C. H2S uh, depends on customer, but for, for MLNG spec, which is simulation spec, is about 21 ppmv. CO2 is a 6.5 mole percent. And also we need, most importantly, we also need to meet the hydraulics also, which is your delivery pressure at a battery limit at, at, at your downstream. And I didn't mention one more property here or impurity, which is your which is your mercury. So mercury, you need to meet for at the gas pack, you need to meet about 0 0.06. That's the limit, 0 0.06 microgram per meter cube. For the water side, it's about 0 0.0, uh, 0 0.01 microgram per liter. And for the oil side, it's about 100 ppbw, parts per billion uh, by weight, right? So this is the reason why we are actually processing the gas uh, or oil and water at top side in order to meet the required specifications. So we will be just focusing on the main equipments today, but there are other supplements, uh, supplement uh, processes and uh, supplement systems that actually uh, complement the main process to ensure uh, effi uh, high efficiency and also to ensure that your oil and gas, uh, your, they will not, the, to assist uh, the separation of your and also to meet the spec of your uh, oil, gas, and water. So this, this, so process there are process control, your utility system, your relief and blowdown, fire and detection system, evacuation, logistics, and also your metering. All right. Okay, moving on. This is a typical uh, main process equipment offshore. So we have the well, and then separate separation will be the. This is the main separation that separates the. Uh, production to its uh, distinct uh, phases, which is your gas, oil, and water. So your gas will go through a dehydration and conditioning process. Our conditioning will be your hydrocarbon dew point and also your water dew pointing. And uh, at the same time, if your wells has impurities like such as CO2 and mercury, 
So there will be additional uh, system in place, which which is your CO2 and H2S uh, removal system, and also your mercury removal system. So mercury removal system, uh, it, it, uh, mercury removal system should be installed if there is a mercury con uh, high mercury content, and it is installed for for each for each phases, yeah, for each phases. It cannot be installed for a full well stream. So you need to separate it to its distinct phases. Then, uh, then. Uh, Mercury need to be mercury uh, MRU need to be installed. It in, need to be in place for each and every phases. All right, and the gas can is metered and and also it's either it be uh, sold as the sales gas or can be used for gas reinjection or gas lift gas lift. For all for the all phase, it will uh, all phase there will be a. Uh, all treating, which is to remove uh, uh, all in water, uh, to remove all in water, or your emulsions, and it goes to your. So basically, here you have uh, all your tilted plate separators and uh, corrugated plate separators. So, and uh, then it goes to your metering system. And before going to the metering system, you need to stabilize your 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 crude. Huh? Your so your crude need to be stabilized. So in order to make to make sure that that why when the oil is being transported from offshore to onshore, there will not be any uh, flashing in your uh, in your pipeline, right? And also to stabilize your crude and uh, to in, to a certain extent, if it is possible to meet the uh, read paper pressure that I've mentioned earlier. And the water water they will go through the water water treatment your hydrocyclone system system and order your dissolved uh, gas flotation units uh, in order to meet the uh, environmental regulation for uh, and uh, for water disposal so and also you may have a tertiary treatment you know for your water water injection or water flooding uh, such as uh, oxygen scavengers so that will be your tertiary treatment for your water treatment uh, so that, that we need to uh, meet the en uh, environmental spec for water disposal, which is your water in oil spec that is uh, 40 ppmd, right? Based on a Petronas specification uh, for offshore, for, for onshore it's a uh, 10 ppm, 10 ppm. So and uh, for based on a DOE, which is Department of Environment, then we need to meet the spec of 100. So basically. Petrona spec is much more stringent as compared to DOE. So in general, the design and selection of process systems and pro process utilities of an oil and gas field is uh, primarily based on volumetric flow, your physical, uh, your properties and also your nature of your well, well fluids, the composition of your well fluids and uh, product specification and uh, sizing and also your facility itself it, it's designed on uh, standards yeah? and the practices adopted by the owners. Okay. So let's look at wellhead. So what is inflow? So basically your reservoir. So the inflow is actually the flow from your reservoir to the well bore. And it is a function of your reservoir pressure and also your formation permeability. Outflow would be, uh, uh, outflow would be the flow from the well to the production facility. To your top side and it is highly dependent on your back pressure that is imposed by your top side facility and also of course the physical nature of your well fluid which uh, that it depends on your water cut gor uh, cgr and also your oil gravity so this is a these are the typical components of a well head so we have the kill uh, wing valve kill wing valve is for injection of uh, chemical injection that it be used for chemical injection, right? Uh, so chemical inje chemical uh, inhibitors will be actually injected through through this flange, right? And uh, there are two two valves that I've already mentioned uh, earlier with regards to the safety moment that I've shared. The two valves are the first valve, which is your upper master valve, which is your also known as your surface safety valve, that is normally. Uh, manually actu uh, actuate uh, operated or some at some cases it can also be hydraulically actuated and you have the lower master valve which is your SCSSV 
So FCSV stands for surface control sub uh, surface control subsurface safety valve, and it is often uh, that uh, this particular valve is uh, hydraulically uh, actuated. So this uh, allowing it it to be means of a uh, means of a uh, well control. All right. So and then we have the choke valve here to choke down the pressure to to bring down the pressure in order to bring down the pressure to the uh, to meet the processing facility requirement, right? Which is your that will go to your header. So production will goes to the header and it goes to your uh, separators. So the so the pressure we need to meet the pressure of your downstream uh, downstream unit. So the choke valve pressure it depends on your uh, downstream unit. At the same time, so basically, uh, let's look at the well head follow line and manifold. So we, uh, as you can see here, we have the HP header, LP header, and also the test header, right? And uh, your wells can be actually segregated uh, uh, to its uh, to its uh, operating condition. So for high high pressure wells, it goes to your high pressure. So we can channel the flow to the high pressure header. Low pressure wells goes to the low pressure header and the uh, uh, and the test header will only be used during uh, well testing, yeah. Or else it will not be. Uh, it is not normally operate operator. It is just using. Uh, it, it is just used during uh, uh, test uh, during well test testing. So let's look at uh, gas oil separation. So all uh, all fluid all well fluids normally produce as a mixture of two phases, or in fact three phases, which is your Vapor phase, your oil phase, and also your water phase. So liquid phase here means uh, it's a combination of your water and also your oil. So these two phases require entirely uh, different handling, measuring, and also processing methods. And the reason why we need to separate the uh, oil and oil, gas, and water is because we uh, we want to avoid any two-phase flow in the downstream lines uh, that will cause uh, incur uh, high back pressure and also uh, surging and uh, slugging problems. At the same time, we need to meet the spec for each and every phases for the sales gas spec and also uh, your oil spec. So that's uh, another reason why we need to separate your well fluid to its distinguished uh, phases. So this, the basic principle used to separate two phase or in an oil and gas separator is based on first is a uh, force of gravity that separates the oil and gas. So basically, the heavier, comp comp heavier of the two components or the two phases will fall to the bottom and the gas will rise to the top based on the, the, uh, temp uh, the uh, density difference. So separators can also be classified according to its function and their what function they serve. So for example, for a se se separator, in this case, separator can be a two-phase separator or it can be a three-phase separator. Two-phase separator, it just uh, separates the gas and the liquid. Whereas uh, three-phase separator, there's another compartment in the in the test, test separator that is separated using a weir to separate your water phase as well. Scrubber is used usually used uh, at, uh, at the suction of your scrubbers are usually you can see scrubbers at the suction of uh, every compressors in order to uh, uh, remove uh, any entrain uh, liquids in your gas. Because we do not want gas going into, we do not want liquids going into your compressor and start impinging on your impellers that will damage your compressor. So scrubbers are you, you, you normally found in a suction of uh, compressors, and usually it handles a high GR, uh, a high GR stream. Eh? Free water knockout is to separate free water from a combined gas, a hydrocarbon liquid, and a water stream. Total liquid lockout is just to remove the whole liquid. So basically, this you can be you you can uh, see this uh, the first uh, that will be your first stage of separator. Huh? And filter filters uh, is to remove any solids from your gas and liquid uh, liquid stream. And uh, we have also have a fly knockout drum, which is also considered as separator. That is also to remove liquids uh, from your fly system. All right. 
So this is the uh, typical uh, horizontal two-phase separator and a three-phase separator. As you can see, as you can observe here, we have a compartment for the water phase separation. And whereas your, your two-phase separator doesn't have the compartment, that, so basically it separates the liquid and water will come together in this uh, liquid outlet stream, All right? Your oil and uh, water. And this is your gas, uh, gas outlet stream. And so it is divided into three sections. Huh? The first section is called the, uh, the, the uh, inlet, inlet, inlet section, and then your gravity settling section, and your, and, and your mist eliminator section. So basically, most of your separation will occur at here, this section, which 70 to 70, 75% of your separation will occur at this section. And your gravity, gravity settling section, uh, whereby your droplets of oil will that is heavier will drop to the to the to to this uh to this liquid uh phase whereas your mist eliminator uh, removes any small small droplets that is being entrained in your gas before uh, so basically it will coalesce the small small droplet to a bigger droplet and uh, eventually it drop into the into the liquid liquid phase and your pressure of your Pressure of your vessel is controlled by your PCV here, which is your pressure control valve, and your liquid level control, liquid liquid level is controlled by your liquid level, All right? So this uh, is controlled through a mechanical device or final control element, which is your your control valves. Now let's, now let's look at the horizontal three-phase separator. So horizontal three-phase separator, there will be section for water separation. And now uh, before the, before before proceeding, proceeding to three-phase separator, I, I would like to also introduce another internal, which is quite important, which is your vortex breaker. So vortex breaker can be found in both separators. So what does a vortex breaker do is actually when a liquid level drops to a point where your gas starts to, <coughs> start to entrain into your liquid phase, and uh, cause that will cause a uh, gas blow by. So basically, vortex breaker actually prevents uh, that to happen. All right. So we will we can see some separators having this. Uh, some some does have some and some does and some do not have a uh, vortex breaker. All right. So that's that's the difference between the two phase and three phase. And as and another another. Another uh, component that you need to look at is actually your downcomer, which is your inlet diverter. Inlet diverter. You can see a two-phase separator diverter. There's your your diverter does not go into your liquid phase, whereas the whereas your three-phase the inlet, inlet diverter goes to your uh, goes to your water phase. That this will actually promote water washing, so that any small droplets of uh, oil that is uh, oil, uh, uh, oil in water emulsion. All right, it will so the, it will promote washing and uh, it will promote mixing of that uh, small small droplets to become bigger droplets so that it will uh, your bigger droplets uh, will be separated easily to the uh, oil phase, right? Or else, it, or else it will entrain in your uh, water phase. So this will help the this will help the promote the separation of your oil and your oil and water in your water phase. So the two-phase separator, same goes to here. You see your three-phase separator, your inlet diverter goes to your uh, water phase here, you see. So the basically, this is called a downcomer, all right, downcomer. And uh, let's look at the horizontal vessel and vertical vessel uh, uh, differences. So horizontal vessel can, uh, can handle large liquid slugs, all right? Uh, and if there is a headroom restriction at your platform, if it is you have a height restriction in your platform, then a horizontal separator will be a preferable preferable op option as compared to vertical uh, separators. And low low down downward liquid velocity for degassing and deforming purposes. For vertical vessels, when you have a smaller plane plane area, then uh, then it is, is much more recommended. And easier solid uh, removal because uh, solid was tend to deposit at the bottom, oh. and it, it can be easily collected as compared to uh, horizontal separators. 
and uh, liquid removal efficiency does not vary with liquid because your your G, because vertical separators usually handle high gr uh, high gr streams gr, GR streams where and your uh, handles a uh, lesser liquid as compared to a horizontal separator and therefore the liquid removal efficiency does not vary with the liquid level liquid. So basically, if let's say for a two-phase separator, if it is it increases up to a certain extent to a, let's say to a to the to the uh, high high alarm uh, setting, what you can later you, what you observe is that there will be liquid carryover to the gas phase. All right, to the gas phase because uh, which is but whereas for a two uh, for a, for the vertical separator, there's some bigger room here. You look at the gas phase. You have a bigger room for liquid to rise, and cause a cause a liquid carryover problem. So that's the that's the that's the reason for this. And vessel vo volume is generally smaller as compared to the uh, three phase separator. So let's look at the components that you can see in a in a separator. So these are the major components. That, component A, okay, which is your primary section. Or uh, that's actually absorb or your inlet diverter that absorbs all your uh, momentum of your fluid, and seventy. So most of your gross separation will occur at this section, which is about seventy to seventy-five percent of your uh, separation. Huh? And then B section is actually a settling uh, set, a gravity settling section. D section is your liquid collecting section, which is your water and a uh, uh, oil, water and oil. And C is your mist eliminator section, all right? And your mist eliminator section, uh, so at the mist elim eliminator section, you have certain uh, component which is called your vein pack, either your vein pack, your mist, uh, your mist extractors, uh, and uh, yeah, your mist extractors. So basically, what what it does is actually um, to to re remove any particle size or oil oil particle droplets that is lower than lower than a uh, ten micron, smaller than ten micron, and uh, and also to remove uh, any to to meet the liquid carryover of uh, less than zero point one gallons per million scuff at your gas phase, right? And also at the same time, there's also controls and leave it relief really, which is not shown here. So basically, is your Separator is also safe, safeguard by a relief device, which is your relief valve or your pressure safety valve, and your control system, which I mentioned earlier, that is your PCV and your uh, LCV for your liquid and your, for your pressure. These are the example of our inlet uh, devices. So you have the plate defector, half open pipe, salzer proprietor. So it all this depends on on the efficiency and also uh, the momentum of your fluid. So basically, this one can handle up to eight thousand pascal uh, of momentum based on BTS. Cyclonic inlet device can handle up to sixty thousand pascal, right? So and sixty thousand pascal. So it has higher efficiency in uh, uh, handling high momentum fluids and also a uh, most of you and also sub. As high efficiency in separating your uh, liquid and oil and water phases, right? So the purpose of uh, inlet device is actually to change the flow of direction, and then to in to reduce the momentum of your incoming fluid. And most of your gross separation will occur at this uh, inlet device uh, section. So let's look at mist eliminators. So mist eliminators such as uh, wire mesh, uh, soil tubes. Vein pack mist eliminator is to reduce the liquid carryover down to 10 micron in size and also to meet uh, and also to remove uh, uh, the liquid carryover to less than 0 0.1 gallons per million scuff. Right? In terms of size, is 10 micron. In terms of quantity, is 0 0.1 uh, gallons per million scuff. All right. So if, if you look, if you notice, uh, at a surface facility, there's a number of number of stages of separation. So that that can, can be denoted as the high pressure separator, intermediate 
intermediate pressure separator and a surge vessel. Intermediate pressure separator will be your LP separator and your surge vessel. So the reason why you, you observe that there are many separators uh, at top side is because in order to stabilize your crude, stabilize your crude and flash off all the gases out so that it is easily to be exported through a pipeline from offshore to onshore. And at the same time, uh, to meet the read vapor pressure to a certain extent, right? Because uh, once it, it goes to an onshore facility, there will be another content, uh, there will be another crude stabilization unit in order to for storage for storage. For for example, if if there is an FPSO at uh, offshore, then we need to meet the read vapor pressure of ten to twelve psi because it, it, it will be stored. But for a cyst for a for a production whereby uh, it is exported or all product which is exported from offshore to onshore then we do not we do not meet, need to meet the 10 to 12 psi uh, read vapor pressure since it's been transported but we need still we need to stabilize the crude to avoid any flashing in your uh, single phase uh, pipe, pipeline because we do not want to have any uh, issues such, such, such as slugging and cause uh, back pressure to the uh, processing facility all right high back pressure so for in that case the oil production will be sent or will be sent to the onshore facility at the onshore facility there will be a crude stabilization unit another stabilization unit but usually that stabilization unit will be a column with a reboiler all right in order to meet a very tight spec of your vapor pressure which is 10 to 12 psi let's look at the gas system so gas the first process that I would like to introduce is actually the gas dehydration system. So if let's say hydrate inhibition, which is your chemical injection, is not suitable for, uh, so not suitable and a hydrate is likely to form, uh, vapor, vapor, the, your water vapor in your gas phase need to be removed from the stream. So this is process is called like dehydration process. And usually we need to meet the safe gas pack of two to uh seven pounds per million scuff in order to avoid corrosion issue and also hydrate issue the two most commonly used uh, processes are or methods are absorption process and adsorption process there are also processes such as refrigeration but this is less common we will be focusing on uh, absorption and adsorption process today so for an absorption pro process actually your glycol units eh? your glycol units whereby your wet gas Will come in contact with your lean glycol as is channel from the top of the column so uh, this will be uh, so your wet gas will come in contact counter and you'll leave your rich your glycol will reach as a rich glycol uh, rich glycol means uh, glycol that already absorbed the water so there's a certain water content in your glycol and it goes to your mac regen unit mac regeneration unit or your steel column call it it, it, it's also known as a stable, uh, it's not, uh, it's also known as a distillation column, can be known as a distillation column. What it does is there's a reboiler in order to heat up the uh, mag to boil off all the uh, water vapor that is being absorbed from this column in order to recover the uh, lean uh, glycol. All right. There is also stripping, stripping gas will be introduced in order to meet a very tight spec of lean, uh, lean glycol spec. So it depends on the process. Some processes does uh, have stripping gas. We use stripping gas to strip off the water from your glycol. Some doesn't have, all right? And you have a hot, uh, you have a uh, hot utility requirement here in order to boil off the water in your glycol. In this case, they have used uh, burner gas, all right? Or we can use also uh, hot oil such as lube oil, lube oil to as a medium for hot oil, a medium for your reboiler. Right. Uh, if there is a, any losses, glycol losses, because this is, since this is a closed loop system, so we might expect some some losses in your glycol to the gas phase, especially. So in that case, then we need to have a makeup stream, all right, to make up any losses. So your lean mag will be recovered, as you can see. This is your lean mag. Huh? Your red line is your lean mag. It will be recovered and will be channel back to the regen system, uh, to the, sorry, to the glycol system, right? So uh, 
so uh, absorption process the process involves absorbing water, water vapor from uh, using liquid desiccant in this case using uh, glycol the most commonly used glycol for uh, uh, the DIG system would be liquid desiccant would be the TEG triethylene glycol all right okay absorption so absorption using uh, it, it using it, it uses uh, solid desiccant to remove water and as compared to liquid desiccant uh, solid desiccants has uh, has higher efficiency or it can meet a tighter spec or water water in gas uh, water in gas uh, requirement tighter spec for that so usually this process this process uh, you can see uh, very commonly used in uh, cryogenic process right cryogenic process whereby we will, we are looking at a very low temperatures sub zero temperatures so in that case we need to remove the water to a very very uh, to meet the very very tight spec uh, in order to avoid any freeze out of water and also hydrate formation right and you can see that uh, for a day, for a absorb adjunction system you have a two two uh, towers one would be in a, one will be operating and one will be on standby but during standby this particular uh, tower will be recovered right through a hot gas system so basically the, it will be uh, alternating alternatingly both towers will be operating all right so, all right so one tower is on stream absorbing water and uh, while the other will be in recovery mode or will be in a regenerated mode and cooled so the hot 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 gas is used to dry to dry off or to to draw off all the water that is being absorbed from your tower in in your uh, from your desiccant after after which it's cooled with the unheated gas stream and the towers are switched before on, on stream uh, tower becomes water saturated so once it's water saturated it will be switched back to the uh, re regenerated uh, tower so it will operate alternatively so so a solid, solid uh, desiccant unit generally costs more and to, to be operated also higher. So your capex and opex for this unit is higher as compared to your liquid desiccant system. Therefore, they use it, they, they, their user is typically limited to application for as high express content gases and a very low water dew point requirement. All right. In process where cryogenic uh, temperatures are counted, solid desiccant uh, hydration usually is preferred over conventional methanol injection to prevent hydrate formation or ice formation. So these are the um, categories, three categories that we can see for a uh, adsorption process. The gel, so gel desiccant, we have alumina desiccant and molecular sieve uh, desiccants. So they are, they are just a solid desiccant, uh, a solid bed that actually just remove water through absorption process. All right. Okay, next system would be our chemical injection system. So chemical injection system, we have a methanol injection uh, and also a glycol system. As you can see from this uh, figure, your your methanol system is not a it's not a recovery. It's, it, 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 you cannot uh, regenerate uh, methanol. Whereas uh, for a glycol process, uh, there's a regen uh, system in order to recover your uh, glycol. So it is a closed loop for a glycol system, whereas, it's a, whereas for a methanol injection system, it is a, it, it's not a closed, it's, it's an open system, all right? And now uh, what you can observe that uh, where, where you can see, usually uh, we will see methanol requirement at the choke because when you at the, at the choke of your well well uh, the reason why is because as a well well fluid produces across a choke wall there will be a big pressure drop due to that there's a joule tonson uh, effect and your temperature will drop uh, drastically and in, to avoid uh, any issue on hydrate where, where the temperature approaches the temperature uh, hydrate uh, dissociation temp uh, temperature we need to inject methanol in order to shift the hydrate curve towards the left hand side so that your operating condition will not enter at the hydrate formation zone so that's the purpose of injecting uh this is this 
uh, chemicals are called thermodynamic uh, inhib inhibitors all right that actually shift the hydrate curve towards the left hand side and uh, there's another there are not, there are not other chemical injections for hydrate uh, prevention or uh, hydrate prevention or mitigation which is your khi or kinetic hydrate inhibitor so khi can be there are two types one is your ldhi low dosage uh, hydrate inhibitor and the other one would be your anti agglomerants so khi uh, so ldhi actually low dosage hydrate inhibitor uh, what it does is actually it slows down the kinetics of your hydrate it allows hydrate to form to a certain extent but with a 10 degree subcooling that means it, it allows allows the operating condition to enter the enter this uh, hydrate curve about 10 degrees so that is the subcooling beyond that your ldhi will not be effective anymore so it uh, it slows down the kinetics of your hydrate formation whereas your anti agglomerants what it does is actually it uh, prevents the Hyd uh, hydrate clusters to form bigger bigger clusters or to agglomerate coalesce and form uh, bigger bigger clusters uh, that might clog your flow line so th these these are the other these are the uh, the, uh, the other chem chemical injection is used for hydrate prevention so le let's look at the uh, hydrocarbon dew point control unit so hydrocarbon dew point control unit uh, as mentioned earlier we need to meet the fuel fuel gas spec and also your sales gas spec of uh, 950 uh, to 1050 BTU per scuff, or typically we need to meet the hydrocarbon dew point temperature of minus 10 degrees C, right? Uh, so the schematic, uh, the gas actually, so the gas should, should it, it, go, it will be ref, uh, cool down, cool down to, to its dew point, and whereby your liquid or your condensate will be removed from your gas. So as th that's the way we can actually meet the uh, GH3, which is your gross heating value of 950 to 1050. So let's go through this process uh, one by one. So we have a well stream. So it goes to your processing facilities. It goes to your uh, play, uh, uh, free water knockout drum. And then it goes to your dehydration system. And if there's CO2, CO2 or H2S, uh, H2S uh, in your gas, then they will they will need to be removed. So this is this process comes after all those process, which is downstream of all the main processes. So this comes before exporting, yeah? before exporting the gas or before your compression system. Uh, so what it does is your gas is, will be cooled using this uh, heat exchanger. So it goes to a heat exchanger where the gas will be cooled. And there's a choke valve here or a valve or a JT valve that actually Cools down the gas to drop, drop the pressure at the same time, uh, promote the uh, Joe Thompson cooling. So, this separator will act as a low temperature separator or your cold separator. So, your go cool stream from here will be a cooling medium for your this particular heat exchanger. All right. So, when your gas is being cooled, your liquid will be dropped out. All right. Liquid will be dropped out. Or your condenser will drop that and it goes to your condensate stabilization unit so this condensate stabilization unit uh has a reboiler and also a hot utility requirement here to boil off uh any vapor light ends huh? to boil off any uh, light ends which and also to meet the read vapor pressure of 10 to 12 psia so once your condenser is being stabilized it goes to another separator here, which is your glycol condensate separator, where it separates the condensate and also your glycol, right? And your rich glycol or your wet glycol, it goes to your regeneration system, glycol regeneration system, in order to recover your lean glycol, whereby water vapor will be removed. Also through a uh, this through a distillation column, all right? So this is, and it will be spiked. So basically, your uh, your sorry your lean glycol will be uh, will be recovered and injected back so it's a closed loop system whereas your condensate will be stored to in a storage tank and where storage tank that when anything goes to your storage either your oil or water uh, oil or condensate you need to meet the uh, read vapor pressure of 10 to 12 psi all right um so this is uh this is the hydrocarbon dew, uh, dew point control unit 
so uh, maybe i can uh, i can share an experience of mine so this uh when i was with angel tech we came up with a process whereby we, we recover condensate from flat so it, it employs this particular technology which is a hydro viewpoint control unit system that uh so we apply applied this particular system to a flat system but the flash system is operating at a low pressure. So what we did, we did is we uh, jack up the pressure, and and then only we reduce the pressure to to its uh, to its flare, uh, to the flare 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 operating pressure. The reason why we are, we increase the pressure to a turbo expander is actually to to recover more condensate from the flare. And once we have recovered, so basically removing condensate from the flare is good because it can reduce your CO2 emission to the environment. As for example, butane has four carbons, four carbons, right? Butane. So basically every four carbons of butane will, will produce four mo molecules of, uh, four molecules of uh, uh, CO2. So in a way, if we were to remove this, uh, components from the flare, flare system we could uh, for, from the flare gas we could actually uh, reduce the emission by 20 to 30 percent at the same time the recovered condensate can be spiked back into the uh, export pipeline so basically this is the technology that i uh, that i worked with previously from uh, in my previous company and yeah so we have uh, won multiple awards because it's the first 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 in the world application right and uh let's look at the uh, condensate stabilization so condensate stabilization as i as i mentioned earlier is to storage of high vapor pressure condensate so is to store the high vapor pressure condensate uh so before storing the high vapor pressure condensate we need to first stabilize it uh, in order to avoid any safety reasons due to possibility of vapor cloud formation which is to meet the flash point of 60 degrees C and RVP of uh, 10 to 12 PSI. So the hydrocarbon vapor light ends is flashed off from the high vapor pressure condensate in the atmospheric storage tank due to the pressure difference. So and uh, condensate stabilization process is used to remove the light ends to the optimal level. All right. So you, if you look at this in your column, in your stabilize, condensate stabilization column, you have uh, multiple trees here. That promotes the contact of, uh, or to promote the contact of vapor and uh, liquid, or to promote separation. Uh, actually, not to promote uh, contact. For in this case, it promotes separation because it pro it prolongs the residence time. All right. Once you prolong the residence time, and you have heating require heating uh, from your reboiler, uh, so it will actually promote your separation of uh, lighter ends from your. Uh, from a condensate, all right? The trace actually, the trace will help to promote the uh, separation in order to meet this particular spec specification. Now, so moving on, let's look at the gas treatment for H2S uh, and uh, CO2 removal. So the objective of this uh, uh, module is to make everyone understand on the purpose of CO2 and H2S removal from a hydrocarbon system and aware of various technologies and areas of application for bulk removal and polishing. So natural gas that is supplied to your to our Malaysian uh, LNG, which is which is located in Bintulu, is uh, must meet the current uh, LNG must meet the current LNG spec. So basically we need to meet the spec at the uh, MLNG uh, with MLNG facility, the, we need to meet uh, less than 6.5 mole percent of CO2 and uh, less than 21 ppmv uh, H2S. So your, so at top side we need to remove your CO2 to the spec, all right? Because uh, MLNG can only accept 6.5 and also uh, 21 ppmv of H2S. So there are two types of uh, processor. Uh, the two types of processor that we can uh, we can uh, we can employ at uh, offshore. One is through one is to through the sulfur recovery route, but the sulfur recovery route it's uh, not common and 
never been done before offshore. It's usually onshore, whereby sulfur will, sulfur deposit will be will be formed. Okay, because it's very difficult to handle sulfur at uh, at, at offshore. You need to have a bigger, very big uh, it, uh, space requirement to handle the sulfur. So it's not feasible to produce sulfur offshore. So usually this is on, on for onshore system. For the offshore system, as you can see, your sour gas goes to your gas uh, to the top side firstly, whereby you separate your acid gas, uh, your H2O and CO2, and it is injected to the reservoir. All right. And your hydrocarbon products here will meet the spec of 6.5 mole percent, less than 6.5 mole percent, and 21 ppm H2O. So there are many terms uh, to describe the composition of natural gas. The terms of acid gas uh, and um, sour gas are often interchangeably used. A sour gas is a gas that gas that gas that has a H2S content. All right. If just predominantly, if it is just CO2, then it's not uh, it's not considered sour gas. That will be considered as a acid gas. All right. Where and whereas an acid gas is any gas that contains significant amount of acid gases, which is CO2 and H2S. All right. So thus, this carbon dioxide by itself is considered acid gas, eh? but it's not sour gas. Sour gas, it's uh, predominantly H2S. Okay. So these are the number. These are the uh, acid removal processes that uh, common common acid uh, gas removal processes. So you have a solvent, solvent absorption based uh, uh, process, solid adsorption process, membranes, direct conversion to produce uh, sulfur and cryogenic fractionation. Uh, we will look into all this process in detail in the subsequent slides. So cryogenic process is uh, something which is quite, uh, uh, it is common for a Reynolds process, but CFZ Outlaw is, uh, it's a, both of these technologies are actually emerging technologies. Outlaw is actually been proven and been already been also, but uh, been already been applied in one of the fields. CFZ is still new, practically new, and uh, it is al has already been uh, uh, proven, uh, proven uh, using a very low flow rate. So this technology is uh, it, it is Exxon Mobil's uh, technology, all right? So Rhinom is the most common technology for cryogenic fractionation. Uh, let's look at that first. Uh, let's look at a chemical uh, chemical solvent. Oh, I know. Uh, so so yeah, solvents absorption technologies. There yeah, we can we can divide it into chemical, physical, and hybrid solvents. So chemical solvents are amine such as amine base and alkali salts. Physical solvents. Uh, okay, these these are all the vendor. Vendor solvents, yeah, and hybrid is a combination of your chemical and also physical solvent in order to complement each, each and uh, each and uh, each other's uh, advantage and this that disadvantage. That's why uh, hybrid uh, hybrid uh, solvent is actually introduced. Okay, chemical solvent. Chemical solvent processes actually remove uh, H2S uh, and CO2 through a reaction. Uh, with a material uh, in the solvent solution, right? Solvent solution. It is known as a, also known as a amine sweetening unit, and it's been used for years, more than uh, nearly eighty years, to remove H two S and CO two from your sour sour gas system. So these are the most commonly used uh, uh, amines, and they are being differentiated and differentiated and it has different acid gas loading factor so your formulated mda has a higher uh, acid gas loading factor of up to 0.6 all right that means it can absorb 0.6 uh, moles of uh, acid gas over one mole of uh, solvent all right not not to absorb it can react it can react up to 0.6 because it's a, this is actually a reactive process, a solvent, uh, amine base, amine sweetening unit, chemical solvents. Most new amine units uh, use a formulated MDA because 
it, it is uh, it is able to tailor the amine for a specific uh, to remove specific uh, sour gases and at the same time to reduce the uh, corrosion issues because uh, this system is very highly susceptible to corrosion issue um, the reason is because uh, you you cannot have 100% uh, MEA uh, the solution strength you need to meet a certain solution strength for it to be effective okay the solution strength here that means it com comprises of uh, water so 20% MEA 80% water that's what that's what it means 35% DEA 65% uh, uh, would be the rest would be water so since water is present so corrosion will be uh, it's a very it is a very uh, uh, big issue for a for a chemical uh, for, for this particular for this particular solvents whereas for formulated MDA as you can see it seems it can handle higher higher solution strength which is higher solvents as compared to water so and you look look at a hybrid hybrid can handle up to 80 so basically your water content here in your solution is has already been reduced so that's the reason reason why uh, there's a reduced corrosion issues associated with the, associated with the MD, MDA solution over the normal MEA and DA solution All right so let's look at alkali salts so alkali salts are only very it's good for bulk removal but not good for polishing uh, polishing polishing is whereby we need uh, whereby we need to meet the uh, safe gas spec bulk removal here means it removes bulk of the CO, uh, acid gas content or sour sour gas uh, leaving behind certain traces of h2s and co2 where it it is not meeting the spec as yet so we need to have another another separation unit or another polishing unit to meet the sales gas spec so a chemical solvent which is uh, based on uh, alkali salts could not meet the sales gas spec Ex uh, if you look at the if you look at the amine sweetening unit so amine sweetening unit to a certain extent it can handle but there's also a limitation which i will show you later that's that's the reason uh, why, why uh, physical solvents are and also uh, not to say physical solvent hybrid solvents are more preferable to meet the uh, uh, the sales, sales gas spec. The, these processes, when used alone, are typically not uh, suitable for application of, as, a, as I mentioned, tight h 2 specification. And the process is generally uh, not generally competitive with uh, amine processes. And it it enters a very at a high pressure. It operates a very at a very very high pressure, uh, high temperature. Then, therefore, we need to treat. We need to have another cooling uh, system requirement and add additional equipment to the system, right? And since it is uh, it is operating at a high temperature, therefore it is able to a certain extent to remove other sulfur uh, species such as COS, uh, COS your carbonate disulfide is other type of uh, sulfide uh, sulfur compound component in your gas, all right? So the disadvantage of alkali soil is maybe it is difficult to meet the tight H2 aspect and also uh, cooling requirement of your treated gas. Let's look at uh, physical solvent. So as I mentioned, physical solvent, solvent uh, is similar to your chemical solvent, but it is, it is not based on reactive process. So your solvent uh, operates based on uh, solvent, operates based on the gas solub solubility within the solvent instead of the chemical reaction so it depends on the gas solubility your acid gas solubility in uh, in your uh, physical solvent so it is preferable this process preferable it's very highly preferable for uh, gases with high partial pressure partial pressure in the in the gas uh, typically limited to box removal to, to meet the tight spec of uh, Safe gas spec of uh, in MLNG, so it is not able to do that. So we need to have another uh, uh, downstream. We need to have another polishing system, right? And it operates at a very low uh, temperatures. So it operates at very low temperatures to promote the separation because uh, at a low temperature, physical solvent, the acid gas uh, solubility into acid gas solubility uh, in the in the physical solvent will increase. So it it is able to. Uh, remove uh, 
uh, H2S and CO2 uh, effectively. However, the, the most uh, the major disadvantage of this particular process is that it actually co-absorbs your hydrocarbon. So they, you will face uh, hydrocarbon losses, whereby your hydrocarbon here I'm talking about uh, actually your heavy heavy hydrocarbons. So uh, your part particularly your uh, C5 plus, right? So this is one of the and this process is very good for bulk removal as compared to uh, chemical solvent. Uh, yeah, as compared to chemical solvent, all right. So if you notice your chemical solvent and your physical solvent, the process is almost the same. If you, so chemical solvent, as I mentioned earlier, so chem chemical solvent, we have an absorber column. This is your absorber column, and this is your desorber column or your regeneration column. So what it does is your lean amine goes, let's look at this one. So lean amine goes to your, to the top three and will come in contact uh, with the sour gas uh, con uh, counter currently. So it, it will react, your solvent will react with your acid gas. And at the same time, you react and, uh, and absorb the CO2 in H2S. And then it will go to your bottom product, bottom yeah, bottom stream, and it will be recovered through this particular column, which is your recovery column. And it has a reboiler here to boil off all the acid gases, H2S and CO2. Right, so we have a two two towers here, your absorption and your regeneration column. Same goes to a physical solvent. We have a contactor or your absorber, and also your H2S stripping, which is your recovery column. Okay. Well, these are some of the uh, vendor commercial process uh, employing uh, physical solvent. These are all the vendors uh, chemicals here. Eh? Vendor physical solvent chemicals. So, yeah, it has its own properties, and uh, these are the properties of the, the solvent. But Rectisol, for example, Rectisol cannot be uh, cannot be used for removal of uh, CO two and H two S in your, especially in your flue gas. Flue gas is actually flue gas is your gas stream that's coming out from your gas turbine and your gas GTG system. Huh? So the reason why why MEOH you can't use this particular system for this particular application for flu gas treatment or your or your flu gas treatment or exhaust gas treatment uh, to remove CO2 or H2S is the reason here because uh, the presence of oxygen in your flu gas. When you have flu gas, because in your gas turbine, your flu gas is your your fuel gas. Your fuel gas is mixed with your it's mixed with your air. Air comprises of oxygen. So if we were to remove uh, CO2 downstream of your uh, gas turbine or your exhaust gas from your exhaust gas, your oxygen will come in contact with your methanol and will uh, will oxidize your methanol. And at the same time, you will have losses of methanol. So this is not appropriate for processes to treat, uh, to treat processes uh, of uh, ex exhaust gas uh, streamer, especially if not, it's not uh, uh, possible for exhaust gas stream. So let's look at the uh, difference here. Um, for a uh, humming system or chemical solvent or in a physical solvent, as you can see, at a low partial pressure. When I, I'm talking about low partial pressure, I see when when you have a low content of acid gas, all right? When you have low content of acid gas, your amine loading factor or your acid gas loading factor is higher as compared to your uh, physical solvent at the low partial pressure of acid gas. So it absorbs better and uh, at the same time, it can meet uh, the sales gas pack easily at a low partial pressure. Whereas it comes to a point where your solvent reach its saturation, your chemical solvent reach its uh, saturation and it will not, it will, it will not able to uh, absorb um, CO2 in H2S anymore at a certain partial pressure. As compared to a uh, physical solvent, physical solvent is not, as I mentioned earlier, it's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, pos uh, efficient in meeting a uh, sales gas pack. It's not able to re uh, meet sales gas pack. 
But as when we have very high content of acid gas in your stream, your gas stream, your physical solvent is much more preferred for bulk removal, right? As compared to uh, chemical uh, chemical solvent. So as you can, as I mentioned earlier, chemical solvent is much more preferable for polishing when you have low partial pressure in your well, partial pressure of acid gas in your well stream or in your gas stream. For a high partial pressure system. Uh, acid gas pressure, pressure system or pressure uh, acid gas uh, content, high acid gas content system, then uh, physical solvent is much more pre preferred. But uh, okay, so your solvent solvent loading is actually also known as uh, acid gas pickup, right? The amount pickup the pickup of uh, acid gas. So uh, yeah, I've already uh, so I've already actually mentioned on the. Uh, Advantage when advantage and disadvantage for physical solvent earlier. So let's proceed with the hybrid solvent. So hybrid solvent is a mixture of uh, both the chemical solvent and also your physical solvent and water. So this combination of both of the solvent actually complements each other's advantage and disadvantage. For example, chemical solvent has a uh, disadvantage in terms of, in terms of corrosion issue. Uh, so so physical solvent is, is doesn't have so it complements that and also and also uh, physical solvent is not good uh, in a meeting sales gas spec in when you have a low partial pressure in your stream whereas ch chemical solvent is able to do that so it complements the disadvantage of your chemical uh, physical solvent your chemical solvent so so basically it is able to do do two processes at the same time which is to remove, uh, to remove, uh, to, uh, which is your bulk removal and also your polishing, polishing as well to meet the sales gas spec of six point one two and also six point five uh, more percent for each CO two and twenty one ppm for each two. Basically, downstream of your system, downstream of hybrid solvent, then we do not need to have a, another additional equipment to polish the gas because it's, uh, it, through this one process, single step process, it is able to meet the sales gas spec. It is. To a certain extent, it can remove mercaptans or another uh, sulfur species, COS and CS2. But your physical solvent, however, it absorbs the uh, heavy hydrocarbon gases. Eh? So, see, uh, whereas uh, even with a hybrid hybrid issue, uh, hybrid solvent, this issue is still exists. Uh, losses of a hydrocarbon, but however. It optimizes the energy, energy consumption because for a chemical solvent, it is very highly uh, chemical solvent requirement for energy is high as compared to a physical solvent system. All right. Yeah. So this is done. Uh, yeah. This I've already been men I've already mentioned this. So let's. But uh, yeah, another thing is that uh, as, since this can complement each other and can actually meet the sales gap. Sales gas spec in one single step. Therefore, of course, it is very uh, uh, it is very costly, right? Okay, another system to remove uh, H two S. So this is basically for polishing, uh, and uh, when you have a low partial pressure in your partial pressure of H two S in your stream, this is uh, we are only uh, absorptions absorbents are only only good for H two S removal. H2S removal only, not for CO2. So it can uh, it can handle up to only up to one more percent of H2S in order to meet a low level, a very low level of uh, H2S content, which is 21 ppmv. So this system is actually similar to the gas degradation system for the adsorption process. It's a similar system, and they, it uses the similar adsorbents such as the molecular sieve, zeolite, and uh, activated carbon. All right. Okay, another another process is actually your cryogenic process. Uh, okay, so this is a typical cryogenic process, which is known as the Reinholm process. So what it does is actually through this column, it will liquefy CO, it will liquefy CO two uh, through through a tower, and uh, uh, so we have a the reboiler requirement here and a condenser requirement, and the gas will be we can meet a very very tight spec of. Uh, Sales gas spec. Even we can meet below 6.5 more percent, and we can meet below 21 ppmv. But this is a very highly 
high, high intense uh, energy system. So in terms of energy requirement is much more higher as compared to uh, the other processes that I've introduced earlier. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's also issue with this uh, process whereby you may foresee CO2 being freezing, being, being freeze out in your column. In order to do that, in order to avoid that, we need to inject and recover the hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbons or your NGL, as you call it, natural gas liquids. The natural gas liquid is actually similar to your condensate, even if which is which comprises of highly uh, butane C4 plus. It needs to be injected in order to your, especially to this column, demethanizer column, to avoid any uh, solid CO2 formation along the column. All right. What it does is actually it moves away, moves the temperature profile. This is a CO2 freezing zone. This is a temperature profile of your tray from tray profile huh? from your from your bottom. So this is uh this will be your condenser, top to bottom, right? So basically, this is your temperature profile without injection of uh, zero, zero injection, huh? zero injection of uh, NGL. So it crosses the CO2. Freezing zone. So certain trays will start. Certain trays will, will start for, to foresee CO2 freeze out. And so as you increase your additive injection, it will tend that that will tend to move the operating condition or operating tray condition away from the uh, freezing zone. So we need to have additional column for that to recover the energy. So the pr process is pretty much uh, complex. But uh, as you can see, this can meet the very very tight spec tight uh, sales gas spec. Uh, so as compared to another process which a CFZ process control free zone system uh, which I'm not I, I didn't I, I'm not I'm not showing here it's a single step process just one column where wherever Ryan Holmes process which a conventional column uh, co conventional process has four columns uh, uh, required uh, we require four columns for a CFZ process is a single step process is just require one column and it actually allows CO2 to freeze out and melt in the sub in the in the column so that's the reason why this process is actually quite quite uh quite interesting uh so basically we can actually that particular chamber allows co2 to to form allows co2 to form so high concentration of co2 will be formed in that particular uh, section of your column so at the same at the same time once it form your vapor from your bottom of your product uh, bottom of your column will start to melt the CO2 and and your CO2 will be liquefied and goes to your uh, bottom product. So that that's uh, another system with your CFZ system. All right. So uh, as you can see, this is a quite highly complex uh, system. Huh? So as, you, uh, as mentioned, it's a high energy consumption system, high operating cost, complex operation, uh, moderate environment impact because and more, most of the te technologies are not uh, yet commercially proven for H2S service, only proven for CO2 services due to the nature of, uh, of H2S itself because it's highly toxic. So they, uh, I mean, uh, operators are, and also the technology providers are afraid to, uh, to handle H2S when anything goes wrong, uh, then it would be a HSE issue. So membrane system is based on the selective uh, diffusion of gases through a non-porous permeable membrane. So it is based on the, the absorbability and diffusivity, diffusivity of your gas, your CO2 and H2O can, will, be, will be separated. All right. So methane has a medium rate uh, in terms of your in terms of your fast gas and slow gas, uh, slow gas uh, rates. Your methane has medium rate, where and having carbon have much slower rates, whereas your CO two and H two H two S has diffusion has higher diffusion rate uh, as compared to your uh, methane and uh, hydrocarbon. Due to that nature, your CO two and H two S will be separated. All right. So. So it's true, looking at this process, your retained it and your retained it, you have retained it and permeate. So permeate will be your low pressure uh, acid gases or your H2S and CO2, right? So the and uh, retained it will be your 
hydrocarbon. So you will have certain the only the disadvantage of membrane system is that one you need to have a pretreatment pretreatment system. That means your gas need to be treated in order to avoid any damage to your membrane. First, you need to have a hydrocarbon it, hydrocarbon dew point, and then you need to water dew point your gas as well. Bef, uh, upstream of your membrane system. Second disadvantage is that you will have hydrocarbon losses. All right, hydrocarbon losses about ten percent, and at the same time, your CO two that is this is high pressure. CO two that is uh, being uh, removed here will be at a lower pressure. So if you have a low pressure CO two, then uh, in order to reinject back to the reservoir for secu uh, for sequestration purposes, then your compression requirement power requirement will be higher because you need to compress from a very low pressure, as compared to a cryogenic system whereby you have a liquid uh, your liquid that is liquid CO2 that is formed it is at a higher pressure so if, therefore power requirement for pumping with your your liquid to, to the reservoir for injection purpose would be much more lower so there's a there's a lot of trade-off between all these systems huh? so we have to look at it uh, uh, in a in a very detailed manner and and it depends on the on on your on your content of your CO2 and also your H2S in your gas stream. So a thorough study need to be conducted and uh, we need to we need to tabulate the power requirement, utility requirement, the associated uh, uh, equipments required to make the process possible. So there are not there are numerous things that need to be uh, uh, need to be considered in order to select the appropriate process for your particular system, for your particular system or for your particular system in, in this case to remove a uh, H2S and uh, CO2. Right. Okay, so yeah, I already mentioned most of it. Uh, treatment dis disadvantage. So let's look at uh, non-regenerable scavengers. So non-regenerable scavengers are such as uh, solid-based scavengers and uh, liquid-based scavengers. They are used to uh, to treat feed gas with low level of H2S in order to meet the uh, sales gas spec of 21 ppmv. And they are not recoverable. Huh? So basically, once the bait is spent, you need to uh, uh, you need to replace the bait with a new bait. So, yeah. And this particular te technology actually uh, produces a uh, small amount of uh, small rate, small rate of sulfur within the bait so so basically the handling of sulfur will also need to be take uh, take into account as well when uh, we when we have, we were to replace the uh, bait okay that so two types of uh, solid bait solid based and also a liquid base all right now let's look at mercury removal so basically everyone has to be aware that uh, mercury can present in all three phases yeah on the, the natural gas phase or your gas phase condensate and uh, all phase and should and uh, audience should understand that the implication to asset and aware of the laboratory analysis for reservoir fluids and different types of mercury formed or your mercury it's called a mercury speciation which is your organic mercury your elemental mercury and also your inorganic mercury and aware of the health health as a two personnel. So mercury also is known as a quicksilver, and it is uh, one of the transition metals in your periodic table, uh, which is situated here in your Mendeley periodic table. Okay. It has a molecular weight of 200.59, and it is the only metal that actually uh, that is in liquid phase at room temperature. Okay. If you look at the mercury com uh, contamination across the countries, um, Thailand and uh, Africa has the highest uh, content of uh, mercury contamination, uh, highest con uh, contamination of mercury in most of their fields. So you can see Africa, uh, not uh, sorry, Thailand, yeah, Thailand and Africa, correct, Thailand and Africa. Even Malaysia has a 
fills with a high mercury content. Okay. So you can post uh, post uh, uh, issues in terms of uh, affect our health, environment, and equipment. In terms of health, you can actually enter through uh, through our through annihilation, skin contact, and ingestion, and cause uh, neuro tox. It is a it's a neurotoxin and cause neuro neurological disorders. For example, the Minamata disease uh, in Japan previously uh, that occurred in uh, 1932, uh, 1932 to 1968. And it can cause a uh, kidney and ren renal damage, and symptoms are the shortness of breath and uh, news, uh, nausea and tremors and that. So this particular minimata disease actually occurred in one of the factories. They were discharging alkali, alkali or they were discharging uh, organic mercury into the uh, into the rivers, and people start to consume the fish fishes. So basically, there's a bioaccumulation involved as well, where mercury uh, mercury start to contaminate their fishes and they uh, so uh, residents start to uh, residents consume the fish, and they also uh, been contaminated by the mercury as well. So that has caused a neuro neurological disorder, which is called the which is called the Minimata disease. And uh, environment, it can uh, enter uh, the waterway, air, and air contamination, wet disposition in rain, and bioaccumulation in your organisms. So basically, mercury also can cause galvanic corrosion and the most uh, and also liquid metal embrittlement. So basically, when you have components or equipment that is made of aluminium, especially, uh, and you have gas and your gas has mercury content, then uh, you will have you will face this issue. All right, we cannot have a, that means uh, for in, for high mercury application or high mercury content application. We we will we must try to avoid. Uh, we have to avoid uh, uh, application of, or use of uh, aluminum, right? In your in your process equipments that handles uh, mercury. So yeah, this is the uh, this is the example of an incident involving a uh, mercury that pose uh, uh, what it uh, poses uh, health issues. So. The discharge of uh, metal mercury uh, happened uh, in one of the plants producing acetate hydride uh, in Minamata Bay. So locals at one point actually uh, uh, observed that a cross has fallen from the sky, seaweed no longer growing, and uh, fish start to float and all. And this has caused a lot of fatality in uh, in Minamata Bay itself. Uh, and this particular disease uh, is uh, this particular disease was actually uh, was from 1932 to 1968. So it, it took about 50, 40, 50 years. Oh no, sorry, 30 years to to recover. All right. So that's the reason. Uh, then they 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 started. They have sued the particular production uh, facility or production plant or the manufacturing manufacturing plant for discharging uh, mercury metal mercury into the waterways All right and yeah and uh, minimata convention on mercury was ratified in uh, 2013 which is quite recent seven years ago by 140 countries All right in terms of mer mercury exposure limits so the permissibility exposure uh, limit for various mercury compounds for alkali mercury, mercury uh, exposure is up to 0 0.01 per meter cube. This time weighted average is based on uh, eight hours of working. Eh? Right. RLI is 0 0.1 and 0 0.025. So for biological uh, exposure index, it's up to for in urine, it's up to 35 microgram per gram, uh, and also in blood is 15 microgram per liter. So for in terms of environment, so for Malaysia environment, uh, inland inland waters, we use a uh, standard A, 
which is 0 0.05 uh, microgram per liter. So in for offshore also we use uh, we use this spec. Uh, we need to meet the spec environmental spec with 0 0.05 uh, milligram per liter. Uh, inland waters would be uh, onshore, right? For for environment for Clean Air Act based on Clean Air Act, we need to meet uh, 0 0.01 gram per per normal meter cube. Uh, when we were to emit the gas, right? This is the environment spec that we need to meet. Okay, so mercury is a cycle. Huh? You can see that mercury forms and then it forms uh, and being emitted to the environment and then being deposited to the fresh water, to the uh, rain and goes to your streams and it, it evaporates and we come back, so it's a, it's a cycle, right? And it forms in many ways. It, it can be formed through the uh, geogenic process, biomass burning, soil vegetation, and also through factories, right? And same goes to from, from production also, from, from your offshore production as well. So most of your mercury that is emitted from human emi emission, are, the ma major source is actually 41% is coming from your, from gold mining, right? Where we use this uh, mercury to form amalgam, amalgam to remove uh, gold in your mining, right? And the next would be your fossil fuel, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, cement production, right? Cement production. From this map, you can, your mer mercury emission sources are very predominantly can be found in uh, in our region. Uh. Look at the spots, the red spots are in our region, mostly in our region. So, and um, these are some of the some of the current uh, Petronas fields which are high as high uh, mercury content. So it's up to five thousand ppb, and uh, there are also future fields that has potential mercury contamination. Uh, still in uh, development phase. So fields in uh, Southeast Asia contains a relatively higher mercury compared to other parts of the world. And there are three types of mercury. We can be categorized in, uh, as elemental mercury, organic mercury species, and inorganic mercury species. Right? Elemental mercury, and uh, so basically elemental mercury will be, will, you can, when you have a very low CGR or is a high predominantly gas uh, stream. Uh, then elemental mercury uh, will be will be will be high. The content will be higher as compared to other mercury species. Organic mercury will will be in your oil phase. Inorganic will be in your water phase, right? So if a natural gas with the with, with a low CGR content or low condensate gas ratio, your mercury content will be mostly uh, elemental former 10 percent will be organic condensate mostly will be in uh, organic form which is for example metal mercury and all will be in uh, uh will, will have uh, almost the same uh, same pro uh, proportion between the uh, element i'm uh, sorry the inorganic and also here uh, elemental okay so based on your system uh <clears throat> depends which system if you have a system which has low cgr then most you can see that your natural gas system will be high high, uh, high elemental mercury content okay so separation uh mercury distribution in a separator so as you can see mercury in a water phase you have uh, elemental mercury uh, elemental mercury and ionic mercury which is inorganic mercury all phase will be organic and uh, here will be elemental mercury. All right. So in for all these three phases, we need to have a dedicated uh, MRU units, mercury removal units. So there are many types of mercury removal units. Um, I will explain to you. Uh, I will not go through the processes, the the, the technology itself, but I just mentioned that I would like to uh, let you know that the MRUs uh, need to be separated. Uh, MRU need to be placed for each phases. Huh? You cannot have an MRU for to treat the well stream. 
in, for mercury. You need to first separate it to its distinct phase, then you need to remove it for each phase. Due to time constraint, I am not able to go through this case study, which is quite interesting, but uh, maybe perhaps next time. But let's go through the next module. Um, okay, compression and pumping compression and heat transfer. Right? Pumping. What is pump? It's a mechanical device used to add energy to liquid in order to move the liquid. So the pump actually transforms mechanical energy produced by rotating to pressure or heat uh, or it's known as a potential energy of the discharged liquid. So it's, one is to either it can be used to raise a liquid from one level to another, from low level to high level. So another, it's another one is to increase the boost the pressure from from low pressure to high uh, high pressure, and this is for when you have a very long flow line. Huh? When you have a lo long long flow line, then you you may need to have a, a booster a booster pumps to overcome the internal pressures al along the pipeline uh, due to the transport of your liquid. Right, there will be losses. Of pressure, so we need to have a uh, loss of pressure due to the maybe due to the frictional loss in your pipeline. So uh, for that case, we need to have a booster pump and to force liquid overcoming piping fitting, so piping and also fitting friction losses, and to move more liquid in within a given time. So example, fifty gallons per minute to hundred gallons per minute. So there are two types of. Uh, Pumps, huh? One is the kinetic based energy pump, or one is a positive displacement pump. So kinetic energy pumps increase the fluid pressure indirectly. Energy is added continuously to the fluid to increase velocity. The velocity of the kinetic is converted to pressure or potential energy, and once the velocity is decreased. So kinetic energy pump is used for high flow, low pressure requirement, low heat requirement. Whereas positive displacement pump is used for high heat requirement, low flow requirement okay high heat low flow this is usually for chemical injection pumps and uh, chemical injection pumps we use a uh, mostly positive displacement this one would be uh, your cotp which is your crude oil transfer pumps uh, because since it's a high flow we need to transport crude to, to onshore so we use a uh, centrifugal pumps okay so this is an example so we have an impeller in your centrifugal pump eh? it is radial it is radial radial flow there's two types, radial flow and also axial flow. Axial flow is in one direction, one directional flow, right? So centrifugal pump selection, centrifugal pump selection is based on your head and also your uh, flow rate. So this is how this is taken from one of the standards, which is your deep GPSS standard. And for example, okay, let's look at a performance curve for a centrifugal pump. So centrifugal pump performance curve is based. Is, so we have this is your pump curve, right? This is your brake horsepower, and this is your efficiency curve, and this is NPSHR required. This NPSHR is actually your is given by a vendor, and we need to meet. Uh, basically, we need to calculate the required uh, net pressure suction pressure head available, which is. Uh, to avoid any cavitation to the pump so that so that we need to meet the two to three feet uh, requirement that means your mpsa available need to be two to three feet above the mpshr from your vendor all right this is for the sizing of your pump and uh the highest efficiency the efficiency increases rapidly and reaches to a maximum point okay to this maximum point which is called the bep the best efficiency point all right so basically from here, from this here, you can see that your best efficiency point res resides here. All right, this is your best efficiency point. At what gallons? At about 200 gallons and uh, head is about 30 feet. Right, this is your pump curve. Huh? So centrifugal pumps actually converts prime movement, which is kinetic energy in the impeller, converts the pressure energy in your volume. So basically once here you have the lowest pressure, and uh, what happens is, as lowest pressure here, so it will be sucked into your impeller and be con converted to uh, pressure energy and in, the, in the volutes, this particular volute. Okay. 
So as I mentioned earlier, uh, centrifugal uh, reciprocating pump actually used for low flow and high heat application, and it can handle a uh, highly viscous uh, fluid. Right? And in terms of efficiency, it is much more efficient as compared to a centrifugal pump. Okay, uh, and used for sy systems like uh, chemical injection uh, application. For example, this is a piston. It's a piston uh, displacement, uh, positive displacement pump with double acting piston pump, right? Double acting. Uh, this is a typical uh, positive displacement pump selection chart. It's also based on heat and also your capacity. Okay, compressors. So compressors. So your produce gas after separation and the addition condition is compressed for transmission to downstream facilities for processing and distribution. Some, sometimes as your reservoir also declines, your pressure declines, then we need to have a booster compression first before it goes to your main process or your main, uh, main equipment, uh, your separation process. So, so in case the gas pressure before it can be processed. High pressure compressors may also be required for reinjection purpose for gas leaf and also for uh, gas injection or can be used for acid gas reinjection as well. We need the compressors, all right? So separated gas stream, so basically for sales gas, for reinjection purpose, and for additional gas processing, such as uh, for acid gas reinjection, for example. Uh, as you can see, as you can observe, compressors also can be subdivided into two types, which is your positive displacement compressor and your dynamic compressor. So dynamic compressor is used for high flow also, high flow and uh, low heat requirement, okay? So it it, it uh, achieved by transfer of velocity energy from the rotating blade to the gas, okay? Reciprocating pump is used for low flow and high heat requirement, okay? So this is a reciprocating pump. Uh, so it's also based on a piston. Huh? Okay. Okay. Exhaust flow is a one-directional uh, compressor. So basically, what is exhaust flow is a. Uh, it, it, this one is actually coupled with a, usually coupled with your gas turbine, huh? your exhaust compressor that uh, that compresses the gas to the to to your comb combustion chambers in your gas turbine. If you if you look at a pump of a compressor curve and compare it against a pump curve, it's almost a similar similar thing. But in a compressor curve, we have a, a, we have this uh, what you call anti search line, right? Anti search line for a pump, it call it's called a cavitation line. This one is called anti search. So we cannot operate be below this uh, or in, in this particular region when we are we are we are operating at a very high heat and low. Uh, low flow, you can cause uh, damage to your bearings and can cause uh, damage to your impellers and you can, 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 can cause vibration of your and damage of your compressor, right? Same, we have a head. This is your, a different, uh, different speed of your compressor, a different speed, different radar. Huh? And this is your efficiency line, right? And this is your break cost power line. So in order to safeguard your compressor, there's a there's a surge control uh, valve. For a pump, there's a minimum flow that you need to meet, uh, you need to maintain in, at the suction to avoid cavitation so that your flow will be in, inside this uh, map. Same goes to this one, we have a surge control valve. So surge control valve will only open when your operating condition reaches the surge control line. When it reaches the surge control, this will op open uh, instantaneously and uh, to avoid to avoid any uh, surging to the uh, compressor and vibration okay no this is compressor uh, compressor map yeah so heat exchanger heat exchanger so function to con so basically the purpose of heat exchanger is to conserve any heat condensed vapor or cool product so heat is transferred usually it can only be transferred from hot hot to a cold fluid so it can be so the through a 
through a heat exchanger. So this is the this is the energy transfer device that you can be used. And heat exchanger equipment is classified in, uh, to its applications such as furnaces, heaters, reboilers, vaporizers, heater treaters, steam generator. So these are the typical uh, heat exchangers. Coolers are such as uh, condensers, uh, is to remove heat. So based on, uh, so basically heat is actually form an energy. And based on first law, first law, as everyone know, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only can be changed from one form to another. All right. And it is not possible to transfer heat from lower temperature to higher temperature. That's based on the second law. And heat can be transferred to three ways, so radi rad conduction, uh, radiation, and convection process. So convection is through your, so through heat wave. Conduction is to transfer of uh, heat from uh, direct contact and convection uh, transfer of heat to a fluid, all right, in a fluid. Uh, water mo molecules by, by uh, molecular action or molecular motion. So that few types of uh, heat exchangers. The so first type will be your shell and tube, which is highly co very common heat exchangers. So this particular heat exchanger, the it can meet uh, up to 10 degrees C of temperature approach. And um, it, it can be calcified based on uh, Thema nomenclature. So the, this is uh, one of the uh, what uh, standard that we use to design a Tube, uh, shell and tube uh, heat exchanger based on Tema. All right, Tema. So it is uh, based on the configuration of the flow of your tube section and also your shell shell section. This is a single uh, pass uh, single pass shell, right? Single pass shell tube uh, configuration. Whereby, if you can see here, your is a single pass in one direction, and your tube also is one direction, right? If you look at the this one, this one will be this one. We have uh, two passes of shell and tube. Two passes. Huh? This is your tube section, All right? So it goes here, and your shell will go this way through across the baffle. It will move. So the baffle actually acts to promote to promote uh, heat transfer in order to promote turbulence. When you have turbulence, and uh, that will promote a uh, transfer of heat. Uh, across the tube and also the shell section, shell side. So to consider pl placement of fluid, right? So a tube section, uh, usually fluid with a high pressure and uh, fluid that contains vapor and non-condemnable gases and fluid that is scale forming and toxic and le lethal fluids we put in the tube, right? Where else uh, for the shell, we place the fluid with as small pressure drops desired that uh, that you don't want to have any small uh, big pressure drop. So we we put the we place the uh, fluid in the cell section. Uh, so basically, yeah, for high highly viscous uh, fluid, then we place it in a cell section. If you place it in a tube, then we have a big pressure drop across the tube. So it's better to put in the shell. Okay, and fluid with non fouling and also non-corrosive uh, lethal fluids. We don't, we don't really put, uh, non, we try to avoid to uh, avoid uh, putting uh, non-corrosive uh, material in your, or lethal fluid in your shell. It, that, that, that one should be placed in your tube, all right? And double pipe heat, heat exchanger, is also no, known as a hairpin heat exchanger. So it, 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 it Flows counter currently. Basically, this particular heat exchanger can be found in your Geico Geico uh, gas gas uh, uh, heat exchanger. Uh, good for viscous fluid, all right, and with with flow, low flow rate. Uh, this is a plate and fin uh, heat exchanger. So plate and fin heat exchanger is your brace alumina heat exchanger. So one thing one one uh, disadvantage of this particular unit is that it is very costly and one thing uh, it can one one uh, the advantage is can handle up to 10 fluids in a single exchanger and it's known as cold box and another thing is that uh, in terms of maintenance right it's quite uh, it's quite difficult because you need to remove each and every plates all right 
uh, the layers are being stacked up uh, not uh, uh, it's not a uh, one way so the, the, there's a lot of work for in terms of uh, maintenance and inspection for a plate filling danger another thing is that it is not able to handle uh, mercury eh, because it is made of uh, alumina this is also known as a brace alumina heat exchanger so for mercury application we do, should not use the uh, brace alumina heat exchanger so this is this you, this one can reach can we can uh, meet a very very tight temperature approach okay same goes to plate and frame it, it can can meet tight temperature approach it's lighter and uh, smaller but uh, disadvantage i wouldn't say disadvantage but you only can uh, handle up to two two fluids uh, as compared to uh plate and finish heat exchanger okay uh, and it is easily maintain uh, easily be can be easily maintained uh, fluid flow uh, it's actually fully counter current flow and yeah it can meet a very very tight uh, spec for the temperature approach as well in terms of air cooler heat exchanger so air cooler heat exchanger there's two types induced draft and uh, force draft heat exchanger so the configuration of the fan if you look at this of uh, your force draft the fan is actually and the motor is actually uh, placed at the bottom right the bottom so and your induced draft is where where your fan is actually placed at the top so in terms of efficiency you and uh, maintenance right this one is highly is efficient as compared to this because there's a possibility that the hot air that is from here it's used to it is used to cool these uh, tubes so the hot air will start, start to recirculate back into your uh particular stream uh, but, but into into your in, into this section so there's a possibility for that to happen so that it makes the, the process uh, less efficient as compared to this particular uh this system right so it is uh there's a barrier here to plenum and uh, hot air just directly uh, being uh, ex emitted to the environment and there's no pos there's there's no possibility of the air to flow down downwards okay that's uh that's the one of the advantage of having a uh, induced draft uh, another thing is that uh in terms of maintenance this one is this one require uh in terms of maintenance is much more complex as compared to this because this can be done uh, at the uh, at the lower working level at the ground level whereas this one we need to have a scaffolding in place in order to do maintenance on the fan right so here you can see there's a lot of it's called fin this particular fin actually promotes uh it, it increases the surface area surface contact and that, that promotes a uh heat transfer yeah i've already explained this so uh, reboiler so reboiler is also as i mentioned it is used for condensate uh, stabilization unit so this is to meet the uh sales gas spec for the vapor pressure of 10 to 12 psi all right uh next module which is the last module uh just bear with me there's another 10 slides left so which is the uh, water treatment so uh, objective of this module is to that uh to make sure that everyone understands the petrolas regulation on effluent discharge quality limits for offshore and uh, onshore operation and aware of primary secondary and tertiary produce water treatment so tertiary pro produce water treatment i will not cover in this particular module because uh, this is for water injection uh, requirement we will look at the primary and secondary right so basically effluent water needs to be treated first to meet saturated discharge limit before it can be can be disposed and in offshore operation the effluent water comprises of mainly formation water in onshore similar treatment is required but the discharge standard is much more stringent huh? we need to meet 10 ppm as compared to offshore it's about 40 ppm of all uh, all in water so the treated water can be either injected or can be disposed to the uh, seawater. So you have a primary, secondary, this is a high level uh, treatment, primary and second. So basically when we are looking at primary, we are looking at uh, API uh, interceptors. So API interceptors are not common in offshore because uh, it requires bigger, large uh, plot area. Parallel and, this, uh, and corrugated places are much more common ones, which is uh, used for water treating. 
and it actually coalesces the uh, oil droplets in your oil in water and uh, and promotes the separation of oil in your water phase induced gas flotation uses bubbles right so the bubbles float so you use bubbles so it forms bubbles in your water promotes uh, so basically what it, when the bubble rises to the surface the, uh, the oil will start to etch from the bubbles and it goes to the surface and the oil that is that that is that appears on the surface will be skimmed off using a skimmer same goes to the dissolved gas flotation induced gas flotation has a device called a venturi as a, a, a there's a venturi or eductor that actually uh, produces the the bubbles whereas uh, dissolved gas flotation it actually saturates the gas the saturate saturate the water with gas or air to make to form the bubbles all right and then we have also uh, sec, uh, centrifugal force which is also so basically so, uh, api perils uh, corrugated are all primary uh, treatment induced gas flotation dissolved gas flotation are also known as uh, uh, it's, it's known as secondary centrifugal force such as hydro hydrocycle are known as uh, primary right okay so this is the limit that we uh, we have to meet huh? the saturated discharge limit saturated discharge limit for offshore discharge is 100 ppm based on the uh, doe is under ppm for petrolized about 40 ppm all right but uh in terms of onshore yes we need to meet a very stringent spec which is uh, about 10 ppm okay Okay, this is an API separator. So API separator, how it works is uh, it's based on uh, gravity gra gravity settling. Huh? So we, we we require a big volume to increase the residence time for for all to be to be separated to the surface and being skimmed off. Okay, and usually designed to remove up about ninety five percent of the oil droppers above one hundred fifty microns. And purpose of the first stage separator is to discharge the. Uh, quality of 50 to 100 ppm and require larger footprint eh, as compared to uh, the next treatment which is uh, through through a uh, corrugated plate interceptors so corrugated plate interceptors they are separators they are splits in inside the separator that place actually what it, uh, what it does is actually it helps to coalesce the small droplets of oil in your water so it goes through this passage eh, into this particular passage it is this is actually a parallel plate huh? this is a parallel plate this is a corrugated so corrugated plate has a more surface area for for and also to increase the residence time so once they in, your residence time increase so oil and water can be separated easily and once it reaches the surface oil reaches the surface it will be skimmed off by a skimmer and it's able to meet up to 30 down to 30 to 50 ppm discharge quality Oh, okay, hydrocyclones. So hydrocyclones uh, uses uh, the uses uses a venture. Ventu it's like a venturi venturi, whereby it uses a centrifugal force to remove oil from water. Okay, and it is known as a primary. This is known as a primary separa uh, separation. Uh, primary still considered as primary, and we have a lot of liners here. So basically, to to meet certain. Uh, certain spec of oil in water in order to meet a certain spec of or tighter spec of oil in water oil in water so we need we can actually have have the room to uh, include more liners based on the slots available slots right okay and last but not least uh, gas flotation so gas flot flotation is known as a secondary removal secondary treatment and you can achieve your specs, your discharge spec or quality of 10 to 20 ppm of oil. So as I mentioned earlier, how it works is actually, if you look at this uh, induced flotation, right? It's, a, it's, it's like an inductor here. It induces gas into this particular section and, the, and gas will be uh, injected here. And as a gas injected, uh, bubbles will be formed. So once bubbles is formed, it will rise, uh, rise to the top surface at the same time the oil in water oil in water emulsion will start oil water droplets uh, will start to attach on the bubbles uh, and 
uh, as as it rises up to the surface. As it rises up to the surface, the water, the the oil will be separated. Oil will, will form a oily froth layer, and that's when the skimmer will skim off the uh, oil. This is through a eductor. This is through means of a mechanical uh, device by having a roto uh, motor uh, or a roto to induce or to produce the bubbles. Right. This is through to Bernoulli principle. Just uh, through Bernoulli. This is through inducing through a mechanical device. So you, ne you need to have an additional motor to move the shaft in order to produce the bubbles. And uh, dissolved gas flotation, uh, for, uh, there's another uh, process called dissolved gas flotation. Same, it uses the same principle using bubbles, but the, how the bubbles are formed through a, uh, is, uh, bubbles are formed by injecting gas, uh, by injecting gas into the water to saturate the gas with, to saturate the water with gas. So that the bubbles will tend to form, and will also in, uh, increase the efficient. Uh, will also sorry, will also remove the oil uh, in water through the same principle, right? I think uh, I've ended my presentation um, for today. I so I, I'm sorry that I took took up a third, extra thirty minutes to complete my presentation. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, hi. Thank you hi. so much. Okay. Right. Uh, Thank you. Based on the uh, really good uh, presentation, uh, we actually learned so much of information in two hours. Um, okay. I have three questions that I would like to pose, which were posted by um, our viewers. First question is why thermodynamic efficiency of cryogenic distillation is higher than uh, conventional distillation why thermodynamic why thermodynamic efficiency of cryogenic distillation is higher than conventional distillation why thermodynamic this is for for which process uh, uh, so, uh, okay why is it more efficient? Okay, the reason why yeah. is it more efficient because okay, there are two properties there that why cryogenic process is preferable for. I, I'm talking about CO2 removal, huh? because of the relative volatility we are taking into account of the relative volatility of methane and uh, CO2. So the relative volatility of methane and CO2 is very high, right? Due to that nature of the due to that thermodynamic property, all right, that's the reason why. Uh, when you have high CO2 content, high CO2 content in your gas stream, which is predominantly uh, in your gas stream, which comprises of uh, methane, due to that high relative volatility, separation will be much more easier. And we are taking advantage on that property uh, for for the distillation process uh, to remove uh, CO2 from from uh, methane. Yeah, oh, that's so uh, applicable for for the process that I mentioned earlier, which is your Reinholm process. And then your your CFZ process, all your cryogenic, your cryogenic process. Yeah. So you uh, what you're saying is uh, the cryogenic distillation, the efficiency is um, way higher compared to the normal uh, conventional way of doing a distillation. Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. The second question is: Is it possible for us to use XRF technology? To detect mercury contamination. Uh yes, we can we can do that. But uh, this is for sampling, right? You're talking about yes. Ah, uh, yes. To detect, we can use that technology to sample uh, mercury. That's right. But uh, the the issue is that uh, the components, the number of components is limited to a few number of components in terms of sampling. It's not just elemental. Uh, there are other components, so it's very deep. in terms of sampling itself. Also, there's a lot of uh, error, uh, human error at place, lah. So mercury, in, mercury can be detected, can be sampled, yes. But the thing is, we I I've, I've also uh, experienced cases whereby, at during sampling stage, there's no mercury uh, observed, but at during production phase. After a few years of production, mercury, mercury start to produce from from your production, 
and that that particular field they, it was not designed for to handle mercury at the first place so they have to shut down the system and, and they do not have any provision for mercury uh, removal also they never provide any space for mercury uh for mercury uh, technology to be placed therefore uh they have to shut down and they, they have to they have to install a mercury removal unit uh, on offshore lah. so okay. yeah is it uh is it true that deep water wells have higher contamination of mercury uh not necessary not necessary you i i i'm working with a deep water well now a deep water well oil well and also gas well i'm working with that uh, it's a it's a subsea as well subsea well it's not a it's not a surface well uh i we i do not foresee and i've been working 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 for three projects which uh which is a subsea subsea production I, I don't foresee any mercury contamination uh, on that. It, it, it depends on the nature of your reservoir, your of your reservoir. It's, it, it does not depend on the depth of your well. Yeah. So uh, the last question. Uh, this has come from one of my students actually. Um, he says, "I'm not an expert in acid gas removal modeling. Does HiSIS provide any guidance?" for setting up analysis for acid gas removal yes there is a acid gas uh i see for there's a thermodynamic package called acid gas thermodynamic package we can use that but um my in mind that uh, in the in the software itself you know i see the U e equation of state model uh, there is a package called uh acid gas removal uh, acid gas package that we can be used to so basically to that is uh, sweetening okay. sweetening yeah acid gas sweetening uh package us package we can use that but bear in mind that uh, when you come uh the thing is about equation of stat states uh we need to do validation that's very important when you come up when you when you want so to you use an equation of state, another equation of state or no we validate against experimental data in terms of the equilibrium of uh in terms of the vapor liquid equilibrium we need to do validation against that after doing the validation then validation of all the equation of states then we we have to select based on the best equation of theta for example like i'm, I'm talking about uh, let's say we have a gas gas stream uh gas stream with high water content uh, high water content and we have cpa okay there's another there's a high equus, uh, accuracy us model called cpa cubic plus association and there's also pang robinson in terms of saturation at a higher pressure and when you have high co2 content uh, cpa is much more preferable because it can handle the polar component uh, better as compared to pang robinson right when you do the validation for the water content validation against experimental data there's a vast difference you can see in that uh, in in the prediction of our water content in your acid gas when you use C, when you use cpa against uh, pang robinson so Selecting EOS model is very important before running any simulation, acid gas uh, simulation. Uh, that's very important. So validation validation work need to be done on the equation of state package. Uh, so validation is done through experimental. Experiment, experimental. Based on live samples or? Based on live samples, based on live samples. So what they do in, experiment, in, a, in the lab, they will develop the equilibrium uh, curve based on certain experiment or distillation process or something uh, of a let's say for a binary system uh, co2 methane system they will develop a binary uh, equilibrium curve for, based on that mixture at certain certain uh, uh, methane concentration so we will what we will do in a simulator or simulator or in a thermodynamic simulator we will try to validate based on certain e equation of state and to make sure that to make sure that, that the prediction uh, is as accurate as the experimental data all right so based on that number of uh, various number of equations and state that we will compare the prediction and based on that prediction we choose that particular equation and state and that once we have selected that that part equation of state will be used for subsequent uh, process simulation uh, for the first order for your subsequent yeah. process if you use the wrong equation instead that will affect your your simulation 
and your prediction will not be accurate anymore any longer so that's the first step of of doing for acid gas huh? i'm talking about first step validation is very much very important all right validation is very important okay. I've, I've, I've developed a paper i can share uh, uh perhaps i can share a paper that i've done um it's a sp paper uh, I, I, I ask if my students uh, 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 they want the paper, then probably you can share it with me. I can share it with them. Ah, yeah. Okay, sure. All right. Uh, okay. the, 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 so, to run a ST gas uh, simulation, the thought, you, I mean, you need to you need to first validate. La. So, what's the more important actually, the thought process of running the simulation to the validation and then after after doing the validation and then then you only have to conduct the simulation. Yeah, I I, I can share that uh, that paper. It's, it is available in the public domain though, so it's, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, one patrol paper, is Yeah, one patrol paper. Right. Okay. So uh, those are the questions that I actually received uh, from the students and also the public. So uh, I would like to thank you very very much for a very fruitful. Uh, to our session with good uh, questions from the audience and uh, thank you so much for answering them uh, and uh, this is really really good technical info by you and um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow on uh, flow assurance uh, in terms of uh, on wax management studies all right thank you Erwin. thank you very much mr danarat and thank you. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.